Thank you all for joining me. I'm your host, Sam, and today we're going to be talking about the case of Dina Schlosser, also known as the woman who was guided by the light to kill. Today's video deals with topics like harm to children, self-harm, and murder. If you feel that you're unable to handle these topics, please turn back now. The case of Dina Schlosser is an interesting one. It was actually the first true crime case that I talked about on my TikTok page and it's what got my true crime account started in the first place. There isn't as much about this case as there is, say, a very famous serial killer, but I thought it was time I properly dove into this case in detail. Dina was born as Dina Leitner in 1969 in New York. When she was just eight years old, she was diagnosed with a condition called hydrocephalus, which means that there was an accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid inside of her brain. This means that there's a lot of pressure on the brain, and it can cause symptoms that can change your life completely, like personality changes, mental impairment, seizures, headaches, and so many other terrible sounding symptoms. It honestly does not sound fun, and I really feel terrible for her to go through this as a child. Before the age of 13, she actually had eight different surgeries to implant shunts into her brain, heart, and abdomen. And because of this, her head had to be frequently shaved, meaning that other kids made fun of her at school for it. When she went to university, she decided to study psychology at Marist College, where she met a man who would eventually become her husband, a fellow student named John Schlosser. Dina eventually graduated, but John didn't. John faked graduating, but eventually his family and Dina's family found out, and they were forced to get jobs to make some money for themselves. Dina had previously worked for Visa and for a nursing home, but she left both of those jobs. The people at Visa had been too mean to her, and she didn't like the way that the nursing home staff was treating its patients. But instead of doing anything, she just kind of left. Eventually, she and John had two daughters, baby Brianna in 1995 and Kelsey in 1997. John was interested in computers, and this was right around the time of the big internet tech boom, so he was able to land a job with some decent money, and the family soon moved to Fort Worth, Texas in the year 2000. Dina wasn't allowed by John to work, so she stayed home and took care of her children. After each of her children were born, Dina suffered from postpartum depression, but she wouldn't take her medication unless she was feeling very low. After the couple moved to Fort Worth with their children, they were introduced to the Water of Life Church by one of their neighbors. Water of Life is a Pentecostal church, and it was created in 1980 after God supposedly instructed a man named Doyle Davidson to come to Plano, Texas and speak directly to the people that lived there. The church has some pretty disgusting beliefs, if I'm being honest. Davidson claimed a Jezebel as spirit had infected the city of Plano and that mental illness could be cured away with just prayer. Medication was supposedly witchcraft, and this led to Dina no longer taking any medication whatsoever, as anytime she was prescribed something, John would get rid of it. Davidson also told the church that a witch spirit was found in some women, and it caused them to control a man. In 1987, one of these women was supposedly a married woman named Lisa Staten. Davidson had told her that God had supposedly told him they were supposed to be married. Davidson and Lisa were both married at the time already to other people, but that didn't matter to him and God encouraged it, supposedly. Lisa would frequently become the topic of Davidson's sermons and he would call her a Jezebel and other worse things. She and her husband actually had to go into hiding because of this. They were spammed frequently by Davidson with emails, some of which he posted on his website. These emails ranged from loving to sexually suggestive to downright threatening. A true man of God, right? Davidson also preached that women need to be subservient to their husbands and therefore Dina stayed at home to take care of the kids full time. A woman who questioned their husband was possessed with the Jezebel spirit, according to Davidson, so Dina wasn't really allowed to do that. The church was a hundred mile round trip as it was all the way in Plano, but the family lived in Fort Worth, and somehow still attended services six days a week. Sometimes the family attended sermons until 10 p.m. on school nights, and their children sometimes didn't get dinner as a result. Bear in mind, their children weren't older, they were all under the age of five during this time. When the girls' grandparents visited, they were shocked at how devoted to the church their family had become, but even more shocked at the way they were using it to treat their children. When Dina's mother, Connie, expressed concern, Dina replied, God has not directed me to do anything other than what I'm doing. Connie was not thrilled by this. 
She was worried about her daughter and her grandchildren, and rightfully so. So she decided to call Doyle Davidson himself to talk about Dina and the children, but he didn't exactly like this. He actually called Connie a heathen who was infected with the Jezebel spirit. Seems very on brand of him. So a bit more annoyed now, Connie decided to attend a sermon with Dina in an attempt to try to talk to Davidson in person. When she did, he put his hands on her and claimed he was releasing the spirits that were causing Connie's Parkinson's disease. Connie was incredibly upset, but still Dina was in love with this church and there was no way of changing her mind. Dina completely believed in Davidson's word and he thought he was telling the truth when he said prayer would cure everything. And so did Dina. So before dropping her mother off at the airport, she secretly took her mother's Parkinson medication. Because of this, Connie became completely paralyzed in the terminal and missed her flight. She sat overnight in her own bodily waste until someone eventually realized something was wrong and helped her get proper medical attention. They were able to find a few spare pills in her luggage and she was able to get onto a separate flight home. But that didn't matter to Dina, she was still completely sucked into the Water of Life church. And so was her husband, John. After a while, John lost his cushy job, and in 2002, the family had to move from their expensive home to a smaller apartment. They still regularly attended church, though, as this new apartment was actually in Plano, much closer to the Water of Life Church. Another time that Connie visited, she brought some cough medicine because she noticed one of the children had a cough. Dina took it from her and threw it out, saying, quote, We use prayer. Connie and her husband also became furious when they heard John claim that he was the head of the household. It just seemed like an all-around toxic environment to raise children in. Then in 2003, Dana became pregnant again and gave birth to a baby girl named Margaret on January 9th, 2004. Despite there being no scientific proof, Dina believed she'd actually given birth to twins, a boy and a girl, but that the boy had already been sent to God. Dina had previously been investigated by Texas Child Protective Services after a psychotic episode, and CPS had ruled she could not be alone with the children. Dina's sister-in-law came to live with them in the meantime. But after Margaret was born, that postpartum depression came back, and this time it was much worse. Not long after Margaret was born, Dina claimed she was reading the Bible, and the word cut jumped off the page at her. Her response was to slice her own wrists. She used a pair of scissors, but John discovered her in a bloody bathroom and wrapped bandages around her wrists. He didn't take her to the hospital, call 911, or get any professional medical attention. Instead, he prayed for Dina to get better. Dina later told a psychiatrist that she injured herself in this incident because she wanted to prove that God would heal her. Not long after this, when she was watching the Little Mermaid film with her daughters, she felt as if the characters on screen were laughing at her. She took off running down the street, and her five-year-old daughter Kelsey took off running after her. The two were eventually found, and Dina was found two miles away from her home, but screamed at police when they tried to approach her. She was then admitted to a local psychiatric hospital, and diagnosed with postpartum depression. Dina wanted to stay in the hospital, but John wouldn't let her. CPS kept checking in on her, but Dina kept taking her medication, so they stopped visiting after a while as she had no symptoms. Not long after, John got rid of the medication she had been prescribed altogether. Over the next few months, Dina began to slip deeper and deeper into psychosis. She believed she could hear Noah's Ark being built in the neighborhood, just in the distance. She made animal noises and laughed at random times. She even told John about a belief that came to her one night, that her own daughter Margaret was destined to marry Doyle Davidson, who was elderly. She even told him she wanted to give Margaret away to him. Bear in mind, Margaret was about 10 months old at this point. He supposedly spanked Dina in front of their kids with a wooden spoon later that evening. Around this time, which was late December of 2004, Dina had been up for days reading the Bible, she had been getting very little sleep as a result of this. She had also heard a news story about a boy who had been mauled by a lion, and she took this as a sign that the apocalypse was about to happen. One particular Bible verse stood out to her. If the right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. To Dina, this was a sign. She claimed that she heard God calling down upon her, telling her to cut off Margaret's arms and then her own. She turned on some gospel music, and started with Margaret, using a nine-inch butcher knife from the kitchen to slice through her arms. There were over 50 puncture marks on her. When she was done, she began to slice her own arm off, but she was interrupted by the phone ringing. It was John. 
He could hear the gospel music in the background, but before he could ask anything, Dina calmly told him that she had cut off Margaret's arms. Instead of calling 911, John called good old Doyle Davidson. Davidson told them to call their friend, a woman named Carolyn Thomas, and when Carolyn found out, she called Dina. It was like a giant game of telephone, literally. While Carolyn was on the phone to Dina, one of Carolyn's co-workers called 911. A 911 operator then called Dina directly, and they could hear the gospel music playing in the background. Specifically the song, He Touched Me. When the operator asked Dina questions, she would calmly reply, I cut her arms off. She was completely in a trance. When police eventually arrived on the scene, there was unfortunately nothing they could do for Margaret. The infant had died of blood loss. When Dina was found, she was still holding the butcher's knife and was covered in blood, rocking back and forth. She told the police officers, I felt I had to. After her arrest, she was heard chanting to herself, Thank you, Lord, and thank you, Jesus. After Dina was arrested, her other two children were taken by CPS and kept in foster care. John was forced to undergo psychological evaluations of his own, where he was diagnosed with narcissistic personality traits. The report also stated that he did not do enough to protect his daughters from his mentally ill wife. He regained custody of them under the condition that his sister lived with the family, and he was required to undergo complete psychotherapy and parenting classes. He did all this and got his daughters back in his home. He then filed for divorce from Dina. And as part of the divorce settlement, Dina was prohibited from ever having contact with John or her daughters ever again. Dina was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was committed to the North Texas State Hospital. She was ordered to stay there until she was deemed no longer a threat to herself or others. During her time at the hospital, she was roommates with Andrea Yates, who is, was infamous in her own right for drowning her own five children, supposedly to protect them from Satan. In 2008, Dina was released into outpatient care and was required to take regular medication, see a psychiatrist once a week, take birth control, and not have any unsupervised contact with children. In 2010, however, she was recommitted after she was found wandering the streets of Texas at 2 a.m., but was released not long after. In 2012, she was found working at a Texas Walmart under her maiden name. Once her employer found out, she was let go from the company. As of now, it's unclear where she is. I was unable to find anything about her current status, but she's likely still in Texas. What are your thoughts about this case? Postpartum depression is something that's absolutely terrifying, and I really just don't think that we as a society understand it enough. It affects everyone so differently. I mean, look at the way Andrea Yates and Dina Schlosser handle their postpartum depression. Most people who have postpartum depression don't end up killing other people, but it can still seriously affect them and their loved ones. Thank you all for watching my video. I really do appreciate it. I know there's not too many of you right now, but hopefully that'll change. And if you liked my content, please do leave a comment or a like or something. It will really help the algorithm out and get my content out to more people. If you're interested in more regular true crime content that I post about every day, you should check out my TikTok. Its name should be on the screen now. Until then, I'm Sam Davis, and thank you for watching. Goodbye.